um, if Blake or if uh, anybody wants to let me know when you think we should get started, just give me the go ahead and the start. I'm not sure who else might be in the waiting room or anything like that. So, um, Katrina, I'll be actively letting people in. Um, so, okay. whenever Kathy, the boss, is ready. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kathy, you let me know. I'm. I'm, I think we're ready to start whenever you are. So. All right, perfect. Excellent. Well, then um, I'm going to start off welcoming everyone. Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Fulcher Rude. Uh, I'm an associate professor at SUNY Buffalo State College. Uh, while there, I teach classes in assessment methods and augmentative and alternative communication, uh, school-based issues, and I also teach a class on first person perspectives of disability so students can learn from individuals with disabilities what it is like to have a disability and be in a culture and society with a disability. Um, my doctorate work and my clinical work, um, I'm a trained speech language pathologist. Primarily all of my training has been with the ALS population, uh, working with them, I'm doing things like voice banking, selecting communication devices, um, and continuing to communicate as the disease progresses. Um, I'm so excited to be co-hosting this event with Laura Roberts and to have the IM ALS organization here. So here with us today is the IM ALS community outreach team. They are a patient-led organization that provides resources, education, and help for those living with ALS. One of their goals is to host panel discussions um, with various organizations to raise awareness of ALS and to talk about the challenges um, in navigating this disease. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Laura Roberts um, to introduce herself and to represent our other host, University at Buffalo, and she'll introduce some of the rest of our, our outreach team here today. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Roberts and I'm part of the clinical faculty over at the University uh, at Buffalo. And I'd like to thank um, the IMALS community outreach team, uh, particularly Tim Lowry for reaching out and really spearheading this and bringing this to our attention. And to Dr. Fulcher Rood, you know, for bringing our two programs and schools together. This is a really exciting opportunity for, for students and for everyone uh to learn so thanks to everyone for that um we're gonna have time at the end for questions so um, if you have a question feel free to pop it into the chat or hold on to it and use the zoom hand raise function to ask that question um our moderator tonight from the i am als uh, community outreach team is kathy collette um, she is someone who has lost her mom to ALS and she's going to be moderating tonight. So again, thanks to everyone, everyone who's attending tonight as well. And I'll pass it along to Kathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. And thanks to everybody for coming tonight. Um, these panels are kind of a joy to do. Um, and we have about, we have a couple dozen people who sit in on panels. And tonight, I think you'll find you've got a real all-star group. Um, and we'll we'll take just a moment here um, as we start and introduce ourselves. Um, you get Tim Lowry tonight. We we call it our t-shirts say TLP. That's Tim Lowry panel series on our t-shirts because Tim Tim was the instigator on this and he's our leader. And uh, Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Tim Lowry from Buffalo, New York. I was a pharmacist for almost 30 years before ALS forced me into early retirement. I was diagnosed with ALS October 2018. I enjoy doing these panels to raise awareness and help educate future healthcare students what it's like to live with ALS. Today, I am using my computer device as my voice along with chat to communicate. Thank you for allowing us to join you today. Thanks, Tim. You sound so distinguished. Thank you very much. And as Tim mentioned, um, our people with ALS often use the chat 
um, to communicate. So Blake's helping tonight to watch the chat. And if anybody chimes in with something in chat, we'll, Blake, we'll just go ahead and, and speak on their behalf in the chat. So next up, we have Shelly Hoover. Shelly, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thanks for being here today. I'm a US Navy veteran, was diagnosed at 47 and have been living with ALS for nine and one half years. Did you know that veterans are two to 10 times more likely to be diagnosed with ALS than the civilian population? The VA presumes ALS is a 100% service-connected disease and provides all of my equipment and care. I'm very grateful for that. My ALS started in my left hip over 10 years ago. I had tracheostomy and peg surgeries 11 months ago. I'm actually very healthy except for my stupid motor neurons. My speech was the last function ALS attacked in my body. It was also the hardest loss. I have limited speech with a passing near valve, but I tire quickly. I use a Toby Dynavox for everything, including driving my power wheelchair, publishing two novels, attending law school, lobbying Congress, and most importantly, watching Crash Boom Punk YouTube videos with my grandsons. I am extremely grateful for my speech pathologist. Thank you, Shelly. Shelly's a pretty awesome advocate in, in the ALS world. Another awesome advocate is Gwen Peterson. Gwen, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, for the students on the line, um, this group is, this is a Honey crew, we try not to take ourselves so seriously. ALS might seem like, you know, an intimidating, unapproachable kind of like eek disease, but, you know, these people just bring humor into all of our lives. So, um, yeah, my name is Gwen Peterson. I was diagnosed at 32 years old. Um, that was in 2018. I have no family history of ALS. Um, none, none of the um, known ALS genes. I've had my genetic um, work panel done multiple times and uh, so 90% of us living with ALS are completely sporadic. So there's, um, we don't know why 90% of us get this thing. Um, I, um, I didn't immediately present with um, speech issues. It was probably a couple of years after my diagnosis that I saw fasciculations in my tongue. So my tongue shakes pretty bad. I have excess saliva in my mouth. Um, you know, it's hard for me to puff my cheeks up. Um, certain letters, certain syllables are really hard to push out. Um, thankfully, I banked my voice early on, um, so. That's where I'm at. I'm, uh, I've got some more vulgar stuff going on these days. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Gwen. So those are our three people with ALS on this panel. And then we have three people who will give you a caregiver uh, perspective. Tony, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hey everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Anthony Rosello. I'm originally from Philadelphia. I live out here in Scottsdale, Arizona now currently. My dad, as with Shelly, uh, was a Navy veteran and was diagnosed with vulvar onset ALS in March of 2020, and he passed in October of the same year. Um, his was related to his time spent in Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, so, you know, as Gwen said, it's... It, can just happen to anybody at any time. We did genetic panels as well, and it's non-hereditary, which is a good thing, you know, for future generations and what have you. But um, it's it's a tough it's a tough cause. But you guys showing up here today 
is going to make a world of a difference. So thank you everyone for being out here. Thanks, Tony. Well said. Carolyn? Hi, my name is Caroline Treadway. I am right now, I live in Nyack, New York, which is just north of uh, New York City. When I was growing up, uh, my sister, who, has, who had ALS, my sister and I lived in Erie, Pennsylvania. So um, I'm fully aware of Buffalo and um, those environs. My sister Nell was um, 51 when she was diagnosed in 2009. Uh, she was the mother of three boys who kept her very busy. Um, before her diagnosis, Nell was an incredible athlete, um, rode horses, did eventing, uh, and traded all of that in on her diagnosis um, for life in a condo where she lived with her three boys. Um, she was, as I said, diagnosed in 2009. In 2011, she became ill with pneumonia and in order to survive, had a tracheotomy and also um, she had a feeding tube. Um, and she survived until 2017. And really, when, when people say she lived with ALS, she really lived. Um, we went on uh, uh, cruises with her. She went to horse shows with her friends. Um, life didn't stand still for my sister. Um, I miss her dearly, but I love this organization. I am ALS. And I'm so delighted to advocate for patients like Nell and introduce you to you know, what they were going through and welcome. Thanks so much, Carolyn. And, and you make a really important point, I think, about the meaningful lives that people with ALS are able to live in spite of all the difficulties. And a lot of that has to do with the, the good help that they get from um, communication devices, et cetera. So thank you for that. I'm, I normally don't spend much time introducing myself on these, but I'm gonna give you more of an introduction than I normally do. Um, I'm Kathy Collett in Indianapolis, Indiana. We lost mom to ALS 25 years ago. She was 78 years old. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story because there's a speech language pathologist at the center of it. Um, mom was 78. We noticed that her head was dropping um, as some older people's heads do tend to do. And, after a couple months of that, her speech started to slur. And that's when it's like, mom, you've got to go to the doctor. She did not like to go to the doctor. So she went to the doctor. Um, the, it was a primary care doctor that she'd gone to for years. He had an MRI done and there was a small stroke. Um, the, the MRI, that was back when they still had, had pieces of film for you to look at. And there was a grease pencil circle where there'd been a small stroke in her brain. So he, he prescribed speech therapy for her. So she started a course of speech therapy, worked very hard at it, had a wonderful speech therapist and worked and worked and worked and worked and her speech kept getting worse and worse and worse. After six months of frustrating speech therapy, because she was really putting the work in, her speech therapy got me aside and said, get her to a good neurologist, which we, we did right away. We found, because we thought we were dealing with a stroke, we got to the best stroke guy in Indianapolis and he knew right away that the problem wasn't a stroke. He said that part of her brain on the MRI that had a small stroke, as many 78 year old people do, had nothing to do with speech. And he knew right away there were fasciculations in her tongue. Um, he did a few tests, you know, hit her on the knee with the little hammer and her knee went Kerplow, as many people with ALS do, and it was it was a pretty clear case of ALS to him. So that was a surprise. But mom's speech therapist, we would never have known if she hadn't said something, and that was important. And then she stayed with us through the rest of the journey, which was just a wonderful thing. So as I talk to you today, um, just keep in mind that that there was a kind and talented speech language pathologist who helped us through a, real, a really tough diagnosis and, and course of a disease. Now I'm going to take you through ALS 101 
that was going to go so fast that I'm probably going to leave you with more questions than answers. And that's fine because we'll have lots of time at the end for questions. So um, I'm just gonna go through really fast what ALS is, kind of how it works. And um, this is fast forwarding and then keep track of those questions and mysteries because we'll be glad to answer them during the Q&A. So ALS is, is a, a, your motor neurons are dying. You have your brain and your brain's good and you have your muscles and they're waiting to get signals and the motor neurons are the conduits tell the, the, where the brain tells the muscles what to do. Those motor neurons start to die. So you can see what happens. Your brain's trying to move your hand and your hand never gets the message. Um, muscles start to weaken, atrophy. Um, there are these fasciculations, the twitches, there's cramping involved in it. Um, it's it's a, a, a difficult and very variable path downward with the disease. Um, there are no known cures. There are some treatments that don't modify the disease much, may slow it down just a little bit, um, but there's nothing that really reverses the course of the disease. There's no definitive test for diagnosis. It takes good clinical exam and an observant physician, and then they eliminate things that, that um, it's, it's not. Um, and I think no doctor likes to tell a patient that you have ALS. Um, it, the diagnosis often takes a long time, 12 to 15 months. It shouldn't take that long, but it often does. And that's a real problem in the ALS world because clinical trials are important and they're a, a spot of hope for people. And the window to get into a clinical trial is limited. And oftentimes you use up most of your window trying to get diagnosed. Um, there's a genetic testing is important. Um, I think you've heard a couple people on the panel say that their relatives had been tested for genes. Um, 25 years ago, they didn't do that um, because they knew about a few genes and they weren't actionable at all. So it's like, do you really wanna know that? Now you really wanna know that because there are actions that people can take. There are experimental therapies that are targeting genes. And then um, people have to take that into consideration too as they're doing their family planning. So um, the genetics are important. Um, about 90% of the cases though, as Gwen said, are, are sporadic. They don't involve a uh, family history. Early symptoms, depends on the person. Muscles can start twitching in arms, legs, shoulder, and then the fasciculations in the tongue. Um, there are cramps, spasticity, um, muscle weakness. The, the speech, as, as was the case in my mom, speech got slurred. Um, difficulty chewing and swallowing, maybe some choking episodes, excess saliva. If these symptoms begin in the arm and legs, we call that limb onset. And you heard a couple people who introduced themselves refer to bulbar onset. That's where the symptoms begin in the speech and swallowing. Typically bulbar onset is a, is a more rugged, um, perhaps faster progression um, of the disease. And when we talk about progression, um, most people with ALS die from respiratory failure. The, the, the muscles that control breathing just get slower and slower and shallower and shallower. About half the people who are diagnosed will die within three years. 90% are gone within five years, but 10% are long timers. I mean, Shelly's Shelley's a, a pretty long timer and you can see she's, she's got ALS, but she's doing well. So it's, it's ver variable and you can't say that one person's ALS is like another person's ALS. Um, that the timeline really varies from person to person. Um, well over 6,000 Americans are diagnosed every year with ALS. That number is very similar to the number of people who are diagnosed with MS. Yet there are only around 32 people in the United States living with ALS at any moment in time. People with ALS don't live as long as people with MS. So the, the population of living people is much smaller. Um, an important number is the lifetime risk. ALS technically is a rare disease because there are only 32,000 people with it at any, at any moment, but that does not mean that it's an unlikely disease. Lifetime risk is one in 300. So in a graduating class of 1,200 people, four people in that class at some time in their lives are going to hear you have ALS. 
and that should get all of our attention. As Shelley mentioned, military veterans are twice as likely to be diagnosed with ALS as the general public. They don't know why, they don't know what that connection is, but there is a military connection. Something to know, um, people with ALS burn calories faster um, than the rest of us. They are hypo, hyper, uh, I can't remember my word. Excuse me for that. Metabolism. <laughs> yeah. Hypermetabolic, thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Yeah, so, um, and malnutrition is a problem. People who can keep the weight on with ALS do better. Uh, my mom got very, very thin and, and you could just see um, being thin um, led to a lot more problems with ALS. Um, researchers are inv investigating environmental causes. What is it? Is it diet, viruses, physical trauma, all kinds of things. Conventional wisdom, as with many diseases, is that there's a genetic predisposition and some kind of a trigger, an environmental trigger, but they don't know exactly. There's a lot about the disease that they really don't know. Now, this is the drug pipeline. Um, Lou Gehrig died in 1941, and, and there's not a lot there. Um, there's a, a product called Real Yazole that was approved in 1995. My mom actually took that 25 years ago. Slows the disease down a little bit, um, not a lot, but maybe i give you a couple months. Um, there was another product, Edarabone, that was an old stroke drug from Japan that the FDA approved five years ago. And then this slide was updated this afternoon because today, literally today, another drug was approved um, for ALS. Um, it, its code name was AMX0035 that I actually like better than what we found out the new trade name is today, Real, Relivrio. Um, but approved today, it's another one though that it's not gonna be a miracle drug, but it may slow the disease down and, and give people a little longer uh, lifespan. So um, all of these things that help are, are wonderful, but um, we, we certainly are hoping for uh, uh, some better tools in the toolkit um, soon that might actually stop the disease in its tracks. Um, different mechanisms, all of these approved drugs have different mechanisms, which means that people will want to take multiples. They won't want to just choose one. If they can tolerate all three and afford all three, they'll, they'll want to take all three. Some things about speech that might be interesting, and, and most of these um, points came from uh, Boston Children's Hospital that has wonderful um, programs um, that are of help to people with ALS. So the environmental things, make sure you have your partner's attention. And when I read this slide, I thought, I'm pretty sure the person who wrote that slide isn't married because that's a hard thing to do. But anyway, the, the speech, making sure that people are really fixed on the speaker when the speaker is having problem, ALS problem speaking is really important and getting rid of the unnecessary noise in the background. This next one is one that, that mom's speech language patholo pathologist taught my dad. My dad was 82 years old. Mom's speech got very difficult to understand and dad would have a tendency, he'd wanna turn his head to hear better. And Beth said, no, 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 you've gotta look at her. You have to look at her mouth, watch her mouth. And that makes all the difference in the world. And I actually, when I'm in Zoom meetings, if I'm having trouble understanding someone with ALS, I'll make sure I go into that speaker mode where I get them on the big screen so I can watch them. That's a huge help. Um, some people, especially when they're early on in the, in the disease, they'll use little amplifiers um, that they can hang around their necks that really helps um, other people to be able to hear them better. It's hard to get that good breath to get, a, to get your speech out. Um, avoid speaking while eating is good for everybody. So I'm, I'm not sure that's, a, that's an ALS tip. Um, and then maximize breath support for speech production. You've got to be positioned correctly. Um, sometimes people with ALS will be in the recliner chair because they're comfortable, but that reclining position isn't always the best if they need to speak and, and be understood. Um, some more things, uh, pace your speaking. Um, I'm from Indiana, so the, the part that says be very precise and, and speak in syllables, that's hard for a lot of people, especially um, for us Midwesterners, but um, there are tips that, that people with ALS can follow to, to make that speech a little easier for other people to understand. And it takes a lot of practice between, um, like between my mom and dad and, and between mom and me, um, 
to make sure that you can understand each other. Voice preservation is so important, and this is something that is certainly new in the last 25 years, but different ways of voice banking. And I think uh, some of our people on the panel can share their experiences. Um, some people uh, like doing it. Some people like to use a generic voice, and, and it, it's, um, but it's just wonderful that people have options um, to be able to be understood. Safe swallowing is so important. And this was another one that, that Beth taught us, taught mom. Mom had problems with choking and you know having to take a pill was like a big deal. And Beth taught mom chin tuck. And boy, that, that worked wonderfully. And mom was able to take her pills without choking. And to this day, I mean, I don't have ALS, thank God, but I use chin tuck too and I've got to take a pill and it, it uh, really helps. So different tricks that you can lose, there are different things you can put in the food to make it easier to swallow. Um, the, a, a blender or Vitamix is your friend when you have ALS. So there, there are just a lot of things that you can pick up along the way that, that help people out. Now technology, I, I pulled this down, I've kept this. 25 years ago, my mom, she could still use her fingers. She still had enough dexterity that she could use a pen. This is a magna doodle. This is a child's toy. Mom hated having little slips of paper around. So this was her magna doodle and she did this and she could write us notes. This was before they had boogie boards and all of the electronic things and it worked. And sometimes low tech is your answer. So this was our, our first communication device and, and it's dear to me and I kept it. So um, there are all kinds of different things. Some people use a simple alphabet board and are really good at it um, and they can communicate. So a lot of it's a matter of personal preference, um, the different parts of the person's body that are affected to figure out the right, um, the right device to, to help the person communicate resources. The IMALS support team is great. Um, they, there's a team that does, they used to call them navigators and they have a new name, which I forget now, but they assist people um, finding the right resources. Um, and there's a, a organization called Bridging Voice that provides help with the voice banking. Team Gleason Foundation is to me absolutely the best. That picture is Steve Gleason, who was a New Orleans Saints football player. If you remember the first game after Hurricane Katrina, some guy ran in and blocked a punt and, and the whole New Orleans, the, um, the dome just went up in, in joy. That was Steve Gleason, who was later diagnosed with ALS. Um, and he has been just an inspiration. He works with technology companies. He helps people get the right technology for their needs. So Team Gleason Foundation is a huge resource. And then OCL, uh, we were hoping he could be on the panel tonight and he couldn't make it, but he's a fellow living with ALS who knows a lot about technology and the IMA ALS support team can put um, somebody in contact with OCL if, if people need um, advice on, on what would work, what might work in this situation. Okay, so here we are. Um, it's time for some discussion points. It's time to stop listening to me and we'll, we'll talk, the panel will talk about some things and then keep in mind when we have Q&A, ask us anything. There are no questions that are off limits. Don't be concerned about any question. ALS is a sensitive subject, but people on these panels would rather have you understand than, than be holding a question and not, don't worry about it. It's an awkward disease. No question is awkward. So just ask us anything when we get to the Q&A, but I'm gonna start asking some of my, uh, my friends here on the panel about your first symptoms. I mean, you heard my mom's story about it wasn't really a stroke, it was ALS. What are some of your stories about the first things that you noticed um, and, and how you came to diagnosis? If nobody volunteers, I'm going to call on people. Yeah, so when my dad was coming out of a uh, resection for his on-again, off-again bladder cancer, and he was intubated, obviously, as part of that procedure, and when he came out of it, his voice was really weak, and it almost sounded like someone that, you know, had strep throat. So our first thought as a part of that process was when they intubated him, um, they scratched, you know, his vocal cords on the way down with the tube. 
Um, so we made them aware, you know, immediately that there was this change that took place as he came out of it. And uh, so they started sending us the MRIs and CAT scans and, um, you know, nothing was showing as a part of those. So they moved us on to different specialists um, and no one could find anything. It took uh, two months for us to get to uh, the VA down in Philly, being that my dad was uh, a Navy veteran, to get a correct diagnosis. And this guy knew it right away. Some of the other things that you know we noticed then as a part of that ongoing process trying to figure out what it was he began falling while taking the dog for walks uh cutting the grass and his speech just continued to get worse um and, and it was by the day and it was noticeable um as others had said to the circulations had started at that point and there was a lot of excess saliva too uh, so for us it was it was tough you know having that first symptom just being what we thought was a scratch vocal cord to, to essentially get in the death sentence. Thanks, Tony. And, and that's a, that story about, boy, it seemed like something, you know, completely different, how ALS just doesn't enter into your minds a lot of times. And, and uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Now, that was a bulbar onset case. Gwen, you were limb onset, right? I was, and uh, admittedly, I was typing to K Katrina, re read me the question one more time, Kathy. It's about, uh, it, it's about what did you first notice? Mm. Did you think ALS, kind of, and then what was that diagnostic journey like? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm the one to ask this question, especially as a young woman in my um, early 30s, I had started, it was just a backup, super happy, exciting time in my life, new job, new guy, getting married, planning our honeymoon, it was great, and uh, I was having problems with, uh, we call it drop foot. One of my feet was scuffing on the ground, which led to falls. There were uh, issues with balance and coordination. Unfortunately, I saw a couple of doctors, including the first neurologist, and uh, they told me it was anxiety, that my symptoms were in my, in my head, and, uh, and it was easier to prescribe medication than it was to, you know, refer me for a second opinion or actually watch my walking, observe some of the early physical symptoms. So yeah, time to diagnosis was rough for me. Um, and uh, yeah, that was kind of a glimpse of my journey. Shelly's got her hand up. Thanks, thanks Gwen. Shelly? first symptoms included staggering and falling. I went to the doctor after a particularly bad fall while on a morning run. I remember hoping for an MS diagnosis. It took six neurologists and 10 months for a diagnosis. I found it hard to be taken seriously. I had to be persistent. That's... It's a... Uh... It's a common theme and it's not only young people or women, but you know, we're, we've all got to be persistent um, when it comes to getting answers. And uh, it's so cliche, but we all really had to be our own advocates. We did still, still do. Not true. And I, I think that, I think, you know, they, because it is technically a rare disease, I think a lot of times they, they're just not looking for it. And I know that they're having a, a campaign in, in the UK to try to get doctors to look for it more. 
because just because it's a rare disease does not mean it's unlikely. And it, it ought to be on the list of things that, that physicians actually do consider in some, some situations. Anybody else? Why don't we move? Yeah, oh, okay. Wait, Carolyn, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about my sister a little bit because there were some red herrings there that, that were tough for the doctors to sort through. She, um, she had, she was a horsewoman, as I had said, um, and her first symptoms were weakness in her legs where she couldn't stay on the horses. Um, she, because she had fallen from horses earlier in her career, because she had been in a diving accident um, when she was in high school, there were those things that they thought maybe, you know, the falls from horses and the diving accident were responsible for her having the drop foot um, and having the weakness in her legs. And it took those two things um, really prolonged her diagnosis. I would say, I can't remember exactly, but I'm thinking it probably took about four months, four to five months for her to be diagnosed because of those other possibilities you know, that, that came into play. I, those red herrings, how, how yes. true they are. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go on to a topic that I think is, it's really important. And I think it's kind of hard to get our arms around a little bit. To me, I can't imagine anything more difficult than being faced with a diagnosis like ALS, where it's not like some diseases where you kind of, you get a plan. You're gonna, we're gonna try this and we're gonna try this and we're gonna try this. And then, you know, we have a bunch of things to try. Um, there's not a whole lot to try except trying things to cope with it and trying to get into a clinical trial. Um, how do you handle the, the mental aspects of dealing with ALS? Um, that has to be a huge load. And I know different people handle it differently. I know for mom, her faith was really important and she was older. So I think that makes it different too. She felt like she'd had a good life, but I mean, we have young people here. We have all different walks of life. How do you handle those aspects of ALS that I, I think are really have to be difficult and are really important? I think I see Tim's hand up in the view. Thanks, Tim. Go, please. Oh, I think Tim said, uh, sh shook his head no. Sorry, I might have misread that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do we have anything in the chat? An emotional journey is often more difficult than the physical challenges. I feel like I have an advanced degree in processing grief. Gratitude has been key for me in finding joy and staying engaged in life. And Kathy, there's mm -hmm. a chat um, answering the questions. Thank you. And, and thanks, Shelly. And, and the gratitude is a theme that I've seen in a lot of my friends with ALS. That really helps. Um, uh... Mental health is extremely important, as it is for all of us. In my adult life, I've worked on my mental health and spirituality. I continue to read. In fact, I read now more than ever. Readings that vary from Eastern and Western religions, philosophy, and stories of inspiring people. It has helped me have deeper and more meaningful relationships with family, friends, colleagues, and nature. So each day I start with my meditation and focus on what I'm grateful for. I have to let go of seeing and doing things as I used to. So call it honoring the pain, except where I'm at, be honest with myself, 
then adapt and grow however I need to. This doesn't mean I stop fighting. It means I need to refrain, realign, and move forward. I'm also lucky enough to be married to a wonderful woman who I love spending time with. By no means do I assume I have all the answers. Everyone is different. Nor do I pretend that this is easy. I've made peace with what I'm going through. I embrace each day and look for what ALS has to teach me about myself. I uh, know this is slightly off topic, but um, for our student friends in the room, um, what meditation apps do you use? Um, you know, what do you guys use to focus and uh, calm down? If you can drop those in the chat, that would be that would be really great. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen, and, and thank you, Tim. And, and I think Tim's wisdom humbles, humbles me for sure. So thank you, Tim. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to kind of move on to just some, some nuts and bolts practical things about communication. What are some of the frustrations that you ran into with communication with your yourselves or your loved ones with ALS? I know my biggest frustration in communication was when we would go to a doctor's office or in any kind of a healthcare setting. And my mom had all her marbles and then some. I mean, she was she was the most with it person in the room, but her speech was just horribly difficult to understand. And I always found that doctors and nurses and technicians, they were constantly talking to me. And I had to tell them that she was perfectly capable of making her own medical decisions. It was just her speech was a little difficult to understand. And that was one of the most frustrating things that, that, that was like, they'd treat her like a potted plant. And it's like, no, she, she's, she's all there. Talk to her. So anybody else run into things that are in communications wise that were frustrating? Yes, uh, we're not, we're not deaf. Um, you, you don't have to yell at us. Um, you don't have to come close. Uh, to speak to us. Um, I was just with a friend who uh, uses a Toby and uh, a woman, a woman came so close to her and was talking at her instead of, you know, it's, it's just awkward. So we're, we're not deaf. We can understand you perfectly. Anything else? I just happened to think of something as Gwen was talking. My parents, when I was very, very young, our next door neighbors were, were deaf. And mom learned a little bit of sign language to talk to Mrs. Phillips. And it was amazing after she got ALS, that was handy. Cause mom's, mom could still use her hands okay. And that was, that was one of the nicest things that she had that little bit of an outlet of communication that she knew. Um, back from from when the Phillipses lived next door to us. So, um, how about ways that you you found speech language pathologists helpful to you? Anybody have any stories besides my? Uh... Kathy in the chat, Shelley says, I actually ran out of air before I had articulation issue issues. Then I found it difficult to time my speech with nasal mask on BiPAP. Ah. Uh. And I think that has to be an art to itself that you learned. Any, any um, tales of, of speech language pathologists, good or bad? Tim's got something. I have had speech pathologists slash therapists to help in multiple stages in my care. I did voice banking at the University of Buffalo Lab and was introduced to how a C devices worked for when I was ready to get one. Further along, a speech therapist from the Visiting Nurses Association.
Association came to my house and we went over exercises to help me on my speech and swallowing issues. Next up was a former co-worker from Wayman's who went to college for a speech, was the person who gave me my barium swallow tests, along with some continuing education on my swallowing issues. And finally, at Buffalo Speech, Erica helped me obtain the device I'm using today. I'm grateful for the expertise, compassion, and kindness they all provided my wife and I. Can I ask a question to Katrina? Um, I'm wondering how often, Katrina, you conduct swallowing tests with your ALS patients. Um, I'll also have Laura speak to this as well, because I know Laura and I have, uh, we have um, slightly different um, items that we work on. So primarily for me, I usually am referring out to usually um, the VA hospital or other places to complete the barium swallow study, because I do um, therapy through Buffalo State College Clinic or through my private practice. And so with that, um, I don't have that fancy equipment. So really when I'm working with patients, I'm doing things um, like voice banking. I will work on different speech strategies and swallowing strategies, a lot with setting up AAC devices, both low tech and high tech, but I refer out to my other speech pathologist colleagues specifically for the swallow studies. Laura, I don't know if you have a uh, different experience or how you handle that um, as a speech pathologist as well. Yes, very similarly now. I, I came from the medical field, so I used to work in the hospitals and I, I did home health care and I've kind of run the gamut, but um, now that we're at an outpatient clinic, we don't have the capability to be uh, doing like a modified barium swallow, which which you would need a radiologist and, and x-ray equipment and all of that. Um, there is fees, which is another way to um, look at the swallow with a scope. Um, we also don't do that here. So um, if we really want to get a good viewing for swallowing, we usually send our folks out for that. And then we usually get a, a really great report back that tells us what we could work on in terms of any exercises or other types of swallowing strategies. Good to know. Thank you. And uh, maybe that's why I've never had it done is because my former speech pathologist, they didn't do that in-house. Um, Good to know. And uh, Katrina and Laura, as patients, should we be asking for those sorts of tests? And if so, what's the what's the cadence? Sorry, I'm I'm learning something here. I tell folks um, with any kind of neurogenic disorder, the, the when you first start to notice any issue with swallowing, any issue. Um, is usually when I refer out for that. And usually around here, we do modified barium swallow. Fees, I think, has gotten more popular in recent years, but not a lot of speech pathologists in this area. Well, they do them, but many years ago, they didn't. Um, and so it's more typical to hear of people doing the x-ray for the swallow. Um, but you, I say go right away, and then you get your baseline. You can see exactly where your swallow is at. If there's anything that you can do at that point, that would be helpful. They will let you know at that time. And then after that, I say any major change that you notice, that referral back for that test, or about every year. I usually, I usually tell folks once they have the first one done and you're anticipating any changes in swallowing, go the next year for another one. And then we can compare those two tests and see if there's any difference. Katrina, I don't know what you do with that, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, Laura took the words right out of my mouth. Mouth that would be my recommendations as well. I tell my clients the first time you notice difficulty. I think sometimes people just because you know even everyday normal eating and swallowing, you can sometimes experience you know that went down quote unquote the wrong tube, and you're experiencing you can experience some coughing or some choking, but. Um, 
you know, I tell patients, don't just brush that off, go and look into that. And then as soon as you notice a change, that's also another time to go back. So sometimes what people say is, oh, well, I didn't go because I wasn't, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not choking on the water anymore because we fixed that, but now I'm choking when I, or having difficulty when I'm eating meats or something like that. Well, that's another chance to go. So I really try when I'm seeing my patients, when I check in with them, there's kind of a series of questions that I'll ask. And one of them is, how is your feeding and swallowing been lately? So that I can try to help them uh, make those decisions. So, and then I know that Shelly, um, uh, but uh, something in the chat if Blake wants to talk about that. Thank you. Shelly said, I found my SLP to be the most helpful of the many therapists I see. My technology is everything. I wouldn't have extended my life with a trait if I wasn't able to engage in meaningful ways. Um, and then I'll just share the question that Emma had asked Shelly. I was wondering what are the names of your novels? Um, and Shelly says, Emma, Timeless Sisters and In Ruby's Shoes on Amazon, Smiley Face. One of the things that I'd like to say too is just about you know the fact that there's like the other side of of every story as well. So, you know, as we were going through the process with the VA to get you know different sorts of approvals, you know, my dad was uh, using the Toby Dynavax as well. You know, that process took some time, and not everything is just hey, here it is, let's let's hand it out. You know, there's there's a long process to it. So my dad, from diagnosis to the time where he completely lost his voice was two months and it took three months to get the, the Dynavox. And during that process, the speech language pathologist really made a huge difference for him. He, his mental state was not the best just because of how fast everything was progressing. So where you guys also step in outside of just, you know, helping the swallowing and, and the speech is that mental aspect. You know, he was very concerned with the swallowing and choking and aspirating and all those different kinds of things. And where you guys came into play, at least from my family's perspective, is not only just with that, but also helping from the mental side. So keep that in mind too, that what you're doing outside of just, you know, what your careers are going to be is your, your mental health experts as well. So keep that in mind, because that, that makes a huge difference to people. Thank you, Tony, for such an important point. I, I think too, the our experience with a wonderful speech language pathologist, she helped in ways that were probably peripheral to communication, but she was so good at communication and could help us figure out how to communicate so well that, I mean, she was an important part of our team. And um, I'm all, always will be grateful for her on that. Um, we've used up well over an hour. Um, the panelists, would you like to give the, any, any final advice that you'd like to give the students? I would like to just I thank would you. Like, oh, I go would ahead. like to wish you well and hope you enjoy your career. I hope you practice your profession with empathy. Your knowledge is easy to recall and remember to take care of your own physical and mental health as you strive to give the best care possible. Thank you for allowing us to spend this evening with you all. Thanks, Tim. Very well. I, I mean, who can go after that? That was <laughs> like absolutely perfect. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, what, what you all signed up to do with your careers, you know, is definitely going to make a difference to families and, and patients alike. You know, keep patient with the process and with the patients because it's, it's, there's going to be struggling portions of it. Um, and, and definitely be the beacon of hope, you know, for them as well. You know, and so all someone needs is a little bit of hope in any aspect in life. So I appreciate you all. And Shelly says, don't feel sorry for us. Don't say there's nothing I can do for you. Be encouraging and instead say something like, let's do all that we can to keep you swallowing safely and communicating. Thank you, well said everybody. And, and I'd like to thank the students and, and the, our faculty members too for allowing this panel tonight, um, the conversation. I hope it was helpful to you. I know we learned things at everyone too, but I wanna thank you also for your career choice. Um, this is, it's so important 
Um, and I think that once you've been through ALS, you see the absolute difference that communication can make. Um, and it can, it can give people meaning at a, a very important time in their lives. So thank you so much, everybody. And, and uh, we're ready for your questions, I think. Are we okay with people putting those questions in the chat window? Do you want them to unmute However themselves? You, Both is fine. However you want to do it is fine with us. I know some people don't like to sometimes talk out loud. So okay. students, you can put things in the chat window, just like we do in class. <laughs> yeah. And I'll read them out for you, Kathy, if they come through the chat. Thank you. Um, somebody just sent me this one. Um, is there a rhyme or reason for the age that ALS is diagnosed? That's one that came to me through direct message. So is there a rhyme or reason for the age that ALS is diagnosed? It's it, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, when, when how old are you? I am now 37. I was diagnosed at 32, as I said. Um we all, Kathy, you were probably gonna say it primarily affects older white men. I wasn't uh, back when. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go, go ahead, Kathy. If you look at the data, it's a poorly diagnosed disease. So yeah. if you look at the data that they have, it, you know, there are people in their teens and 20s with these tragic cases. Gwen in her 30s, um, it gets more and more prevalent in the 50s. And then, but there's still, my mom was 78 when she was diagnosed. Um, a few more men than women in the younger ages. And then as they get older, it's more women than men. But my, my position is in a poorly diagnosed disease because I had a mom who almost, she came very close to dying and never knowing it was ALS. I think in a poorly diagnosed disease, if we call it white guy's disease, then that can be a self-fulfilling kind of thing. Um, I think we have to be very aware that the disease moves quickly, it's poorly diagnosed, and that we need to, to be better at having it diagnosed and having it looked for in people who perhaps don't look like Lou Gehrig. So that's mine. Yeah. And Tim that's says, I was 52 when diagnosed. Shelly says 47. Tony said, my dad was 68. And then Gwen, I'll just read your question out loud since I'm going. Gwen asked Tony, um, how old was your dad? And we have a question in the chat. Um, Caroline says, first, first, Caroline says my sister was 51. And then Anita says my aunt was 73. Um, and Debbie asks, what would you like researchers to be focusing on? Quality of life, medical treatments, other areas? I think to me, the dream is always something that'll really modify the disease. But Mom's mantra was when she go to the doctor, if you can't cure it, then at least help us deal with it. So. We've got another question, but I'll give some space for anyone else who wants to answer that. Um, Shelly says stopping and reversing. Um, so the other question was, do you recall any particularly beneficial resources um, an SLP shared with you in treatment, such as an article, low-tech AAC, podcast, et cetera? And Tim, to answer that first question, said definitely more information on what causes it. I think, I think for our family, the speech language pathologist, it, it was the tips and tricks that were just great. The chin tuck. I mean, mom had been struggling to get a pill down every day and that made a huge difference. Um, the watching, you know, the, telling dad to watch her lips, 
I mean, I do that to this day, you know, something that I learned and those things were just huge. Um, and they didn't maybe didn't seem like much at the time. She also taught us how to do the Heimlich correctly, realizing that mom was going into choking. And, you know, I kind of know about Heimlich, but I never learned how to do it correctly. And then my 82 year old father, mom was very thin and we were worried that he would Heimlich her and hurt her, you know, and um, Beth taught us, you know, that when you do it, he, she's, if she's making noise, she's getting the air, don't Heimlich her. Um, but um, that was kind of a, a relief for us. Um, she helped us get a little communication device, um, was not fancy, but we could program um, my parents' address and phone number in there. If mom had to call 911, she could hit that and give the address and phone number um, in case of an emergency. Just a lot of little things that were just so helpful. And Shelly says voice banking was a long process, 1,600 phrases. And, and I, just, I just wanted to point out with the voice banking and thank you, Shelly, for bringing that up. There's multiple platforms to do that on, but there are companies as well that you can donate your own voice so that individuals with ALS can, if they couldn't have the chance to voice bank, um, they can go and listen to kind of a, repro a repository of voices that have been um, downloaded and made. So that way, if you can't have your own voice, you don't have to just pick from the five that are available on um, AAC. And I challenge my students every year in AAC to go and actually go through the process of voice banking their voice, because if you're going to make your clients do it, you should know what they have to do. And thank you, Shelly, for just validating that for me. And Shelly says the platform she uses is Model Talker years ago. Um, and Shannon, I see your question and we will get to it in a second. And um, has that gotten better? So Katrina, um, with uh, more recent platforms, um, do we need to record less phrases or has any of that burden been lifted? Um, I'll also have Laura talk about this as well. The last time I checked in on Model Talker, I think it was down to the, a thousand phrases. So they have cut it down a little bit, but that is still pretty intensive. Um, I think especially, you know, advocating for working with a speech pathologist, um, you know, there's different voice, uh, there's voice banking where you're making your own kind of text to speech voice that is your own synthesized voice. But there are also people that I've worked with where they've just wanted certain messages or phrases or common things that they say to be recorded in their own voice and then to be used. So, for example, I had a grandfather um, that had just became a new grandfather and he really wanted to make sure that he could read to his grandkids. So he picked out like 50 children's books and I went over there and we recorded him saying all of those children's books. And that's what he wanted versus voice banking. So I think it's, you know, working with your speech pathologist and really determining what's important to you and, and how you can do that. Laura, I'm not sure. I you I know University at Buffalo does a lot more voice banking through their clinic than we currently do at Buff State. Yeah, I you know, I don't have the exact answer for that because our other Laura, Laura Smith, does a lot of the voice banking. Uh, my last few folks who have I, I've seen chose not to do voice banking. Um, so uh, my last one was a few years ago. So I don't have the up-to-date information on that. Thank you. And in the chat, um, got a lot going on. So um, Shelly had said the quality of mine isn't great, but it was nine years ago. Um, and then Tim, I believe, was answering the question about beneficial resources from SLPs. Um, and Tim says, simply thick for swallowing, chin tuck, and AAC device use, and then also with my mouth exercise. And I will go ahead and ask Shannon's question. She says, um, prior to tonight, I had never heard of voice banking. For anyone that has undergone the process, what was that like? Uh, 
I'm, uh, I'm gonna drop some Google resources and chat. <laughs> I'll uh, defer someone else here to uh, take the question. Ah, Shelly says, already read my answer. All right, and Shannon says, I think my question was addressed, thank you. All right. Anything else for us? Tim says, my synthetic voice from voice banking is harder to understand than uh, choose one available long and tedious. I knew one woman, she was from Florida. She'd been a special education teacher and um, had terrible bulbar um, symptoms with ALS and, and got a speech generating device. And, and there was a actually a demonstration in Washington one year when they were asking for some FDA approvals on some things and, and she was asked to give a speech. So she, she decided to give her speech. She was gonna flip it over to a British accent because that would make her sound smarter. So anyway, it was, it's a matter of, she had a sense of humor. She was doing the best she could and I'll never forget her speaking in uh, Freedom Plaza in Washington with a British accent. Yes, and can I just say that my sister went through the whole voice banking situation and when she heard it, she didn't like it. So you never knew, she liked using the mechanical voice from her, her speech generating device, but you never knew which Nell was gonna show up, right? <laughs> because she would use the British voice, she would use a man's voice. She, you never knew which Nell was gonna show up. She could be Stephen Hawking whenever she wanted. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and Gwen shared Google has a few speech research initiatives and then she's dropping links. There are, and there yeah. are some speech studies going on too, um, occasionally where they'll want healthy um, participants. And that's a good point. I can uh, I can drop that one in the chat as well. The organization is called Everything ALS, and uh, it was founded by um, a woman. Her husband passed of ALS, and she's a it's tech entrepreneur in like Silicon Valley, and um, she is trying to get a speech and facial recognition biomarker for ALS. Um, so really cool um, study. I'll, I'll drop it in chat. And that would be wonderful if they could catch things in speech to help with early diagnosis. That would How be- How cool and is that? Yep. Even if you're not interested in participating, you should read about it. It's it's cool. Anything else in chat or anything for us? The chat is clear, Kathy. Well, for sure, we'd like to thank you all for your, your interest and attention tonight. And I hope it was hope it was helpful for you. And just thank you for your 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 choice of, of uh, profession here. And I just want to say thank you to the I am ALS organization um, and Tim for reaching out to Laura and I and I'm excited that we could bring together UB and Buff State, and I hope that we can uh, work to, again in the future and do other events and keep bringing all of us together and our students. So thank you so much. Um, you know, if, for me, these are the things that re-energize me and get me back excited about doing what I do. And it's just, it's so special that so many of you shared your stories 
tonight because that's a really unique opportunity that we need to have as as professionals. So thank you for being so open and vulnerable. That's really special. And I agree with Katrina. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I think it's just so great again for Katrina, I, for our students and everybody else on our Zoom meeting tonight. It's been a, a really awesome evening to, to meet all of you and to hear everyone's stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the chat, Olivia says, thank you for the kind advice and for sharing your stories. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone. And if there's any other questions or anything to address, we can stay on, but I think that wraps us up for tonight. And I hope this is the first of a lot, a lot of other panels that we can do together. So <laughs> absolutely. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Laura and Thank you. Katrina. Everyone have a good evening. Yeah, have a good evening. Bye-bye.